Ja, äh, mein Name ist Christian Kreuz. Ich freue mich, äh, dass trotz der späten Stunde noch so viele erschienen sind. Ähm, ich habe eine hoffentlich ganz spannende Präsentation für euch. Ich verspreche, es werden auch wenig Wörter und mehr Bilder und Karten sein. Ähm, bevor ich starte, wollte ich mal ein bisschen rumfragen, wie weit ihr äh, was mit Mapping und Karten zu tun habt. Ähm, wie viele von euch nutzen Karten täglich oder häufig im Internet? Mhm. Ganz ordentlich. Wie viele haben selbst Karten in ihre Internetseiten, Blogs eingebaut? Oh, wow, auch viele. Und wie viele sind selbst Mapper oder vielleicht sogar so Geo-Experts? Uiuiui, okay. Sehr schön, sehr schön. Okay, ähm, ich bin äh, Politikwissenschaftler und ich bin, das muss ich gleich zugeben, Frankfurter. Äh, ach, ich habe, I, I made a huge mistake. I speak in German. I'm sorry, I have to change. Why didn't you tell say anything? Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I just had some, I just asked around some questions about mapping and I'm not going to repeat that, but I'm sorry. Okay, I speak now, from now on in English. Um, okay, I have to admit, I'm from Frankfurt. Frankfurt is famous for the apple wine, uh, which is uh, the rest of Germany hates, but uh, that for this. I work in development aid for the past six years. I worked for a German technical corporation, uh, GTZ, and work for different, now as an independent for different organizations. And uh, I lived three years in Egypt, and uh, Egypt is very interesting because most, I would say, the most innovative digital activists uh, come from Egypt, not only, but they're really amazing activists there in Egypt. And uh, also, I worked there in different projects, and I always, I got to know very much um, the, the difficulty and challenges in these countries, especially because there are not as many data and not as many maps and overviews and possible um, information available as it is in Germany. And I will come later to that. Thirdly, I'm a knowledge activist, or in this regards, I, I joined this uh, wonderful book project uh, from uh, the editor Sokori Enkine, she's also here in the audience, and I wrote a chapter about it, and uh, I really like that project, so I have to promote it here a bit. Okay, I have to say, I'm not a geographic information expert. I very much autodidactically went into this topic, and I love it because it is so much straightforward and everybody can go into it. That's, I have to say that right from the start. So I might make mistakes. It's very possible. But I'm a mapper. Uh, I'll come to that later on when I present a bit about OpenStreetMap. I'm one of these uh, guys who run around with GPS, either with the iPhone or something else, and look at uh, buildings and uh, document things and streets and construct maps. It's a fantastic thing to do. I can recommend it to everybody. So let's get going. Um, I stole that sentence, a map is worth a thousand words, uh, because I think that is really the most interesting aspect about it, that it is so much about visualization and so much about um, reducing complexity. And I have a nice example. It's not a digital map. It's the map of the World Anti-Spanking League. Spanking, you know? Uh, child knows. It's fantastic. One, look at it, and you can understand it. You will see right away that don't seem to be many members. We have Scandinavia, we have Germany, and down there we have Chile. So why maps? Why are maps so interesting? I mean, there are very different opinions about it and very different things. I just want to summarize four uh, about them. I think they give orientation. They're very different of text, reading, and trying to make sense out of it they're quite more concrete and give you an orientation on things. They reduce, as I said before, complexity. We are dealing with more and more data now. We have more and more data available. And uh, maps are fantastic to visualize uh, challenges, problems, different causes. They can represent very different perspectives on issues. Uh, they don't have to, but they can. I come later to that. And uh, that helps, I think, very much to, again, uh, present complex issues. And I think they bring things in context. Um, they show how much I'm interested by it, or how much I be part of the problem, or not the problem, or neighborhood is part of the problem. I will show that in different examples. So let's go into some first mapping examples. I mean, you have seen probably many, but I try to choose some interesting ones. This one is uh, Mundraub. It's a wonderful map project I find about theft. Uh, petty theft, it's a project where, where they map fields across Germany for uh, let's say, stealing or getting fruits and vegetables. Uh, a very nice initiative, I find. Another completely different one is the toilet radar. It's uh, New York City. It's the idea to, uh, yeah, 
collect uh, different possible locations for toilets. And there's also a rating system. So the public library has only three stars. I don't know whether it has the toilet paper or not. But of course, it's not new. I mean, maps have always been used for different kinds of activism or different kinds of politics, uh, all kinds of different means. And I want to present you one example. It's very famous. You might know it. Uh, there's a wonderful Wikipedia page about it. And that's John Snow's discovery. Um, it's back in 1854. Um, there was a cholera disease, and it wasn't really sh uh, clear where does this cholera come from, or let's say how does it spread within the city. It was thought that it was about bad air, or, but it was really unclear, and John Snow wanted to find it out, so he analyzed it more in depth, and uh, he walked around the different households and made interviews. And that's the map he drew from this uh, interviews he did, and through it he find out, found out that basically the cholera spreads around water pumps, so it was very much about water contamination. So I think it's a very impressive example how maps can be used. This is the typical kind of way you're probably um, used to maps. Paper maps, very normal, handy in your hand, you can look at it. This is from San Francisco. Now, this is also San Francisco. There's a digital map, and it's about a campaign uh, for uh, same-sex uh, same marriages. But here, quite controversial, I'll come later on to that once again, it shows the people who donate against the same-sex marriage law. Uh, so it shows exactly in which three different people live and how much they donate to it. So you see here Mr. Pui Yan Knok, no, Pui Yan Kwok, how much he donated. I'll come later to that. I mean, the privacy issue is a huge dimension here, of course. But I mean, <laughs> uh, I remember last year, J uh, Mary Joyce was here in Digital Actors, and she said, like, I think privacy is very different uh, dealt with in Germany and by here in the US, you know, and so I think it is very different, of course. But maps can be done from everybody. Maps don't have to be digital. They can be very, very different. This is one wonderful example, the Stockport Emotion Map, where um, Christian Nolt basically draw this experience, the Stockport is in the UK, where he walked around the city, it's kind of a diary, and you can see in the far left, me drunk, lost Freddy, and he waited his way around. Now I make a bit of a jump. Um, I want to, before I come to maptivism and to different examples, I want to describe the different dimensions of, of getting these maps uh, together and to make such a campaign. And, uh, I want to describe it back again in developing countries, and I call it no maps land. This is uh, one of the biggest slums or informal areas in Kenya and Nairobi. It's called Kibera. And there's a wonderful project going on uh, through the Open Street Map Initiative. Open Street Map, to explain it for those who don't know it, it's um, like Wikipedia, but not for content, basically. It is uh, for a map, for a free, open, available map in the world and with thousands, whoo, with thousands available uh, volunteers who contribute to it. And this initiative is about this uh, informal area in Kibera. And they, what they did the past half year, they um, gathered, they made a project down there in the slum, in the informal area, and engaged the people at this, from this area and asked them to map their own area to map it and, and show what's it all about. But not only about streets, it's about hospitals, the health places, bars, um, cemeteries, all kinds of places. And it's going to be start, just the start. They're going to continue mapping it. And it's very important. I'll come to it later on. I think maps are nothing, very little without data. And the wonderful thing about OpenStreetMap is that it doesn't, it doesn't just uh, put the usual things into maps, it can go in all directions. Like, it's open to everybody to map all kinds of different things. And an interesting jump to Google, this is what Google has offered from this informal area, nothing. I don't want to criticize them because Google is one of the few companies who've done a lot in Africa. They have done a very interesting engagement, but you can see open approach and a commercial interest, so that's very different. What OpenStreetMail also has done recently, or a very nice initiative worldwide of volunteers, is in the ha during the Haiti earthquake. This is the map before the earthquake. You can see there's basically almost nothing, just a few streets. I think it's very bright. You don't see at least little streets. And um, after the earthquake happened, 
lots of volunteers came together. There were crisis camps called. They were in London and different places all the world. And they tried to volunteer to make the map much better. And the outcome is this map. And it is the best map available for ET. No other map is this good, this precise. It was very important for disaster response, for emergency, to have such a map uh, to react to many causes. Ushahidi played a very important role it, uh, as a disaster alert as well. And just to mention, did you know that uh, the best country of OpenStreetMaps covered is Germany? They're the most volunteers in this country. It's quite interesting. OK, let's continue the uh, travel to um, other means and possibilities to go into mapping and to get an overview. You might think of, what the heck is that now? Um, it's, an, it's an equipment for a kite, Drachen, to uh, put that um, with gas to get basically high altitude photos, spatial images. And uh, Jeffrey Warren is doing that, and it's a very nice uh, project. It's called Grassroots Mapping. And what he did, he went to uh, informal area slam in Peru. And out of these kite, he got these kind of photos. Not he, again, it was those people who lived there who actually did it. It's very, very important. It gives a very strong empowerment to the people to have a map from their area and uh, to discuss things, planning, politics. It's very important to have such maps. Um, another very nice mean, I think, is crowdsourcing. You can call it very different means. I just call it crowdsourcing in this regard to get the data for such campaigns. And now I jump back to Germany. I saw this recent example, which I think is very, very nice. It calls Wielmap.org, and it's by the Sozialhelden. And I think it's a fantastic project where they basically um, want people to contribute to a barrier-free map of Germany, meaning putting in locations uh, where there is barrier-free barrier access, like cafes and bars, or where it's not. And uh, I think this is what I come also later on, is that there's a great potential that everybody's contributing to such maps. That's an example you might know uh, from the UK. It's very famous, Fix My Street. But it's, again, this dimension that um, it opens um, such an initiative to citizen. So what it is about is that uh, citizen can um, complain about issues such as a hole in the street or there's trash and things like that. And they can put it on the website and they can also use their mobile phone to document that issue. And the nice thing is it's automatically uploaded to, or it's, once it's uploaded to the website, it's being shown on the map and there's an email directly going automatically to the public institution responsible. And they show exactly which institution has reacted, which not, how fast, and things like that. Of course, the mobile phone plays an increasing role in that. And this is also a crowdsourcing project. It's driven by the Ushahidi technology. Um, and here it is in Africa, where there are laws that um, pharmacies and, and hospitals are obliged to have a certain um, stock of medicine. But um, they don't necessarily have that. And this is an, this is an effort or an initiative to show transparently where there are not these stocks and where they are. So people can, with the under pharmacy and uh, the stocks are, or the medicine is not available, can put that to their mobile phone and it's been sent via SMS to the map and it's been transparently shown. I think it's a very interesting project and it is, has many other means to uh, show such, uh, to use it for different other kind of projects. Am I too fast, everything okay? Yeah. So now I come to this uh, topic of open source intelligence. I find that very interesting, although the, the title, or as I understand it or researched it, the, the, the concept was funnily um, first coined by um, US military, kind of their efforts to not only use their secret, or let's say their, their central intelligence, their secret information, but really uh, trying to get more, uh, more use out of the open or publicly available information. I think it is very important in time that uh, the citizens themselves use a lot more of this public information. And this is the whole day we talked about open government and open data, you know, that uh, citizens themselves take, um, the, take the approach and uh, try to make more out of this available data. And a funny example, for instance, is by floating sheep. Uh, they, uh, they took the uh, Google location uh, from the bars all over the US, and that they calculate out of this the beer belly of America. So they show uh, what, the, 
where are the most bars. It's kind of funny. I'm of, of course, it's not very accurate, but I thought it's quite a good example. So, and data is this especially interesting because it contains, that is an estimate, uh, about 80% your uh, reference information. So we can use a lot of that data available for maps or for different kind of geo services. And a nice example recently made, I don't know whether St Stefan Wehmer is here. Ah, yeah, here you are, wonderful. Uh, is this um, magnificent example from Berlin. I hope I explain it now the right way. You can see there's a shadow map, and there's kind of a shadow over the map, and there's a the kind of clear area in the middle of the map. And what it says is basically, it's, he took uh, public transport data um, from Berlin, and you can see in that location in the middle in the balloon, or wherever you live and what you type in, you can see what you can reach in within 15 minutes with public transport. It's not like a circle, it has different dots, and you basically, if you move somewhere, uh, to new area, you can directly or very easily see um, what you can reach within 15 minutes for public transport. Uh, again, it's an example which you can extend to many other topics. So, I said it many times before, but we need more open data, and I think this day it was very often discussed. I found it very interesting is, and there was this discussion before with the um, representative of the uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs, and um, she said, when she was asked to do more in this arena, she said, yeah, but the Enquete Commission is now there in place, and they were going to have a midterm report in 2011, and they're going to have a full report in 2012. So uh, we're basically going to wait that for that. And I think this is, this is the dilemma. I think we really have to, um, ourselves, put this data more and more together, or force them or pressure them to put it out. And one such way is open address, almost like open street map. It's the same idea that you uh, gather uh, different kind of geodata. You want, maybe you wonder why, why should we do that, or isn't that available? I can tell you, no, it's not available. It's extremely difficult. If you do such applications, you, it is very difficult to get such data. I'll later present you Frankfurt Gestalten, which is one of my projects, to get a street register or street uh, of Frankfurt, just a list of the streets in a file which I can use. It's impossible. I can't get it. It was, it was a PDF file, which was a nightmare to get all the data out of it. It's really, really difficult. It's not available. And I requested the, the office in Frankfurt, and they said, me, sure, we can get it. Uh, this will cost this and this and this. They're all, and you cannot use it on the internet. There are a lot of tools, and I just want to show you two tools where you can yourself start uh, experimenting with it. That's very important. It's not difficult. Mixing maps and data is quite easy if you want to experiment with it. <coughs> and GeoCommons is one such initiative. It's very nice. It has a lot of data available, but you can upload any Excel spreadsheet, whatever you want, and you can start yourself. It sounds a bit geeky, I know, but it's quite easy. And I mean, most of you probably have to deal with uh, Excel, street, uh, Excel uh, spreadsheets anyway. Another one is Google Fusion, which is very powerful. You can really upload huge, uh, massive amounts of data, and you can get, make heat maps, for instance, and all kinds of nice visualizations. Of course, with both, it's always important. It's your data. Be careful what you upload, of course. So let's come to maptivism, maps and activism. This is a nice project. Um, it's um, from New York City, from the New York City uh, Civil, no, Civil Liberty Union. No, I got it right. And it's about camera, about surveillance. So what they did, they mapped all the cameras around New York. So because actually it's funny, one activist put another map out. There's one way left in New York, which you can walk where you're not filmed. So this is the last, he, and he mapped it out. So that's the only way you can walk to Manhattan. Not New York, Manhattan, I'm sorry. Another nice example, again, where I think we can quickly, with one look, or quite good, understand the, 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 this, this issue. It's by the West African Trade Hub from USAID. They did a map about trading routes in Western Africa. And trade is extremely difficult by sea to the uh, seaport, no problem. But once it goes into that country, you will have tons of obstacles. And you can see worse, worse, and there are all kinds of um, uh, barriers and all kinds of uh, stops for bribes and everything. And uh, I think this map very clearly uh, presents the problem very nicely. 
Another issue, another very nice example is this from the Cedar Grove Institute for Sustainable Communities. And um, here what happened is that there was always a suspicion that, there was, that the water was unequally distributed in the city, but it wasn't really clear, was it or not? You know, it was like some people said it, some not. So this institute, they went around and made interviews in different households asking about the water situation. And out of these information, they put a map together. And you can see, I hope, is it visible for you, that basically the water pipeline is between racial lines. You know, Afro-Americans basically have no access or very little access and uh, white Americans have the access. And I think it's also, it, this triggered the change in this community. This map was the, the key of pushing forward th this issue and the problem and make the change possible. Okay, now I come to the project I'm doing for the past months. Um, this is uh, Frankfurt Gestalten. Uh, what we did here uh, basically is that we, um, we used the data available from uh, local commodities, Ortsbeiräte. Um, they're discussing in each district all kinds of political topics. It's not big politics, it's about the pedestrian walk, it's about trash bins, it's about a new uh, tree and all these things. But the thing is, it's something local. I think it's something what matters to people a lot because it's in their area. It's this hyper-local kind of approach, which you have a lot in the UK, but very few here. And we read it out, so you have a map there and you also have a street uh, directory. The idea is that you basically can um, easily zoom down or come to your street and you can see what happens in my neighborhood, what's going on, what's discussed. They have it available right now, the city, but it is a huge database, very complicated to access. And here you can email, you can get an email subscription so you quickly can uh, subscribe to it and get informed the minute something happens in your area. Is this open source? Or? What is open, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, it, it looks like you could, could apply this to every city in the ocean, it looks so commonly usable. The, the platform is Drupal, which is an open source uh, uh, platform. Um, but once they're beyond your software, do you think they're... Just... What do you mean exactly? The, the difficulty is, of course, uh, if, if the city or if uh, in these initiatives they would provide data which is very easy to, to very easy to digest, then you can easily put it in every city. The problem is every city has a complete different website, a complete different way of presenting their data. That is the most tricky thing and that, that makes uh, the most work. But the funny thing is when we were finished with it after months, I now got the information from somebody who knows the, the, the from the database, yeah, the other database, the, the, the company who did it, and they said, oh yeah, we have RSS feed and XML, but um, we just don't turn it on. You might know RSS XML means that this kind of data you can really, this is raw data you can really use easily, you know, because it is specified. We, whereas now it has HTML and PDF and it's very difficult to read that out and to make sense out of it. But we didn't want to leave it like that. What we did is, uh, oops, we, uh, want citizens to themselves put in initiatives. It's very experimental. We don't know where this is gonna go to. Um, but here you see one initiative from Richard, and he just basically wants um, pedestrian walk in Rödelheimer Landstraße. And uh, he's also referring to an already, uh, the special kind of forelag or document where this was discussed, and he wonders why this is not changed. And uh, what we offer there is also that people can use a map and can draw in their initiative, so they can exactly pinpoint where they want to have it and how they want to have it. And uh, we hope that this will trigger engagement, that we hope that we don't use only, we don't give the information, but we also have the people network with each other, they find each other for different topics. And after, let's say now two months, it's quite nice that we have some initiatives. It goes slow, because of course it's a local area only, and um, the thing is just like, as you might know from the internet studies, there are just not so many people online, uh, and there are not so many people um, expecting something like this in the internet in Germany. It's just uh, a slow development, absolutely, compared to other countries like the UK or the States. So let's sum it up. Um, the um, why I find, I think maps and maptivism and, and these possibilities of visualization, why they are so interesting is because it's recognition. I can recognize, oh, that's the place I'm talking about. That's, that's concrete. It's something like, it's completely different of, than reading a text. 
Um, a feeling of connection, it's around the corner, like in the last example, you know, it really means something to me, or it, um, it matters to me, or it should matter to me. And it's connecting the dots, the topics and complex issues. I didn't put in many examples now, not really examples of layers and complex geo things. There's a lot of wonderful thing out there uh, where you have different kind of layers and you can basically, you can look at the political side of, of an issue and you can look at the environmental side or the economic side. I think there's a lot happening and there's gonna be very interesting stuff. And of course it's, uh, I hope we trigger, and I hope that these maps then get, uh, they trigger engagement, that that really has to be changed and uh, that these are helpful in this regard. And in the future, um, I put this slide up from Andrew Turner, which I like very much. Um, it's a bit funny, it's basically RSS feed icons all over the place. But what I want to say with it, I mean, augmented reality was already discussed. The idea that you walk around with your mobile phone and uh, you pinpoint it on a building and you get the information, nice for tourists. But imagine you have um, consumer interest data there. So you go to the streets and you look at pinpoint your mobile phone at the supermarket and it will be not telling you the products but it might tell you, oh, this supermarket is still selling the boycotted products which all the other supermarkets don't buy as uh, sell. Uh, or you look at the, the company and you look, they haven't accepted or haven't reacted yet to the complaints of social protection of labor in China. So I think there is gonna be very interesting stuff available that you basically don't have to go to the internet. It's in, with your mobile phone. You can see an information and uh, the different causes around you. But will it all be good? I mean, I was very enthusiastic and very positive, so I have to say some uh, difficulties and some challenges, of course. And the big thing we had, I think, with the San Francisco example is privacy. I mean, um, getting a lot of data, you have to be very careful. I mean, uh, what kind of data you use in your campaigns and how much to make it public. I mean, there's a lot of data which you better not make public and there's a huge discussion about Google Street View um, showing these photos about maps. The interesting thing is that, I don't know what you know, but this discussion is only in Germany, nowhere else. So it's really interesting, but it's also a bit frightening that it's not discussed as much in other countries probably. Propaganda, since maps are there, there is propaganda. Maps doesn't mean that uh, you, necess you are necessarily transparent or objective. They are perfectly wonderful to ex uh, just describe one of your thoughts or uh, one interest. Special uh, uh, borders are a wonderful example. Borders are just shown in the interest of one country but not in the other one. There are good examples of community mapping, but that is of course very fast into conflict and quite tricky to uh, use then in these regards maps. Um, discrimination. There's this uh, tool, it's called Anti-Social Borometer. I don't know, it's the, one of the most top iPhone apps in the UK. And what it does, technically, I find it technically very interesting, but what it does is that it took information out of the Open Data Initiative in the UK, uh, such as crime rates and other kind of indicators of an area, what the situation is there like. And it gives a percentage. So I'm, I'm let's say, somewhere in, in London and I can see Okay, the percentage of antisocial is 60% here. So, and then you go to another area and it's 40%. Um, it's super famous, it's 100,000, thousands. I think 200, 300,000 people have downloaded it. So, but I think it's, it's, it's tricky, it's difficult because it shows, I mean, what did it tell me? I mean, if I'm 40%, I'm calm, and by 60 I start running? I don't know, so it's, there are really side effects. And of course, very, very important thing is attention. Um, you can make the most fantastic maps and the most wonderful argument, but you, you need the attention, you need an audience to make it, uh, to make something happen. And I was in the farm subsidy uh, um, session. I found, they said it too, it's interesting, they offer fantastic data. And I said very openly, they're frustrated that the data is less used, but once they pile it up and they, they put a summary and a press release out, suddenly people react and they want to put it into press but the data itself, or maybe the map itself, doesn't trigger that kind of uh, reaction. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes, please.
Yeah, uh, there is a lot happening. I mean, uh, the, the question was about uh, whether there are uh, tools to get to extract geolocation data out of uh, yeah geo reference information out of data. There are a lot of tools, and they're getting better and better. But I still think there are no magic tools. There's still a lot of work involved. Really, I find uh, that's the problem. But the more open data and raw material you have, the, the chances are higher. But I think like Yahoo and Google, they, they offer quite impressive tools, definitely. Other questions? system. So if anyone has seen maps of companies and how they relate to each other, I think it'd be really uh, interesting to hear about them or to actually start building them because this is a space we haven't really explored uh, as much as we have the physical space. Yes, nice point, definitely. Um, I just want to draw attention that tomorrow is the Open Data Hack Day and we will have uh, Geodata of Berlin there and a lot of maps, really a lot of maps. And um, I hope I see some of you there because, uh, well, we need the work. Not only uh, developers, but also uh, journalists and people who can say, well, how to present the map in a way that is not discriminating and puts attention to the topic. Weitere Fragen? Ja. Dann vielen Dank an Christian. Ja, noch eine Sache. Ich, ja. also, ich werde die Präsentation rumgeben. Ich habe äh, die ganzen Links darauf geschrieben. Ne? Ja, vielen, vielen Dank, Christian. So, ähm, damit ist die Re-Campaign, der offizielle Teil für heute, vorbei. Äh, die Teilnehmer von der Re-Campaign, die noch hier sind, sind gerne ähm, eingeladen, mit äh, um 18 Uhr zum Supergut zu kommen, zum Open Dinner, wo wir zusammen ein bisschen Abend essen können, äh, uns dann äh, noch weiter kennenlernen können, uns miteinander austauschen können. Ansonsten ähm, guckt, äh, was noch weiter hier ist. Ihr habt Zugang zur Republika. Wenn euch noch irgendwas anderes interessiert, guckt rein. Heute Abend ist hier noch Party. Und äh, Christian, nochmal vielen Dank. <lacht>